Me. And Rupert, as most of you will know, is a professor by trade, if that's the right word, um, a philosophy professor. He works alongside some of the leading climate scientists at the University of East Anglia. Um, and he is also, a, you know, a, the, the, the terminology can be parsed and finessed, but he's an activist or a campaigner of some kind, uh, of, of, of a very distinguished kind, I would say, and, and someone who's done a great deal of work in the public eye for the public good for a number of years. So when he approached me and said, look, I've got this essay, a new, a new sort of thought on what we learned from Extinction Rebellion and what might come next, and are you interested in publishing it? I was like, yes, absolutely. Uh, very keen to see what he has to say. Um, I would like to begin by interviewing Rupert for, it's gonna, it takes a while because the essay is quite intricate and I want to sort of take time over it. For about 45 minutes, I'll be probing Rupert to understand where he's coming from on this. And then we'll have time together. It might um, be about half an hour for questions if everything goes well. So let me begin, Rupert, by first of all, welcoming you. Thanks. Yeah, and then um, I suppose I want to know a bit about you, first of all, because you we can go, there's different ways of doing this. There's there's COP, COP coming up in Glasgow. There's what happened with Extinction Rebellion. There's your involvement with that. But I'm interested a little bit before to set the scene, for those who don't know you, to get their bearings. Um, how did you come into this? How did you come to be in this position, you know, combination of philosophy professor and climate activist? Um, tell us a little bit about the backstory just to get our bearings, please. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks everyone for coming. And may I say, Jonathan, that I really enjoyed the, the, the nuance where you did that introduction. It was like you're trying to make every, uh, every word and every turn of phrase count. Uh, uh, that's the kind of sensibility I like to bring to whatever I do, um, beginning with philosophy, but uh, infecting everything else uh, as well. So I appreciate that uh, way of setting, setting the scene here for our conversation. I think it bodes well. Yeah, so in terms of your question, the way I would like to come at it is this, that for me, there were kind of two parts of my life for a long time. Um, since I was a teenager, I've been a political activist. I was first active, well, uh, uh, before I was even a teenager, I suppose I was, uh, I got my, I, I dipped my toes into the environmental activism pond by going on a Save the Whale demo with my aunt and by doing some sort of local litter picks and so on, which I initiated and won a little, um, uh, won my first sort of uh, prize, I suppose, when I was about nine or something for, for these litter picks that I created in the Lake District and in my local uh, area. Uh, so there was, there's always been this kind of activist side of my life. And then since I went to university, there's been the philosophy side of my life. And for quite a number of years, they proceeded pretty much independently uh, of each other. And then at some point during my time at the University of East Anglia, where I've been for 22 years, uh, they started to come together. It was probably about 12 years ago now, 15 years ago at the most. Uh, and I started to get really interested in, well, eco-philosophy, in applied political philosophy, et cetera. And when that happens, that was a kind of, that was sort of wonderful surprise for me, really. Um, they'd always been kind of Wittgenstein on the, and the other guys on the one hand, and my political and eco work uh, on the other hand. Um, but then they started to integrate and, um, you know, anyone who's interested in my work um, will have will seen that happening gradually uh, over the years. So that's the kind of backdrop for where I got to in about uh, 2016, where I felt myself at a bit of uh, an impasse, really, because um, it just seemed to me that what I'd been trying to do and what so many of us have been trying to do um, in our academic work, in our um, political work or our activism, and in, if we had it, the joining of the two, well, that it wasn't working. Uh, and um, for me, I had an epiphany uh, one day, some of you will know this story, so forgive me for repeating it, but it's salient. Uh, I, was, I was delivering some leaflets for the Green Party, and these words just flashed unannounced into my head. And the words were, this civilization is finished. Um, and on the basis of that kind of somewhat shocking experience, which almost left me reeling, really, um, I started to write because, you know, that's, that's what kind of what I do. 
Uh, and uh, I wrote something and I shared it with some close friends and colleagues and said, look, what do you think of this? Is it any good? Is it important? I'm very nervous about saying it because I'm worried that I'm going to demoralize people and I'm worried that I'm going to be attacked. And basically what, what they all said was, this is probably the most important thing you've ever written. You absolutely must uh, publish it. Well, I still didn't. Uh, it took a long time before I agreed to uh, publish a version of it anonymously. Uh, and then, um, and that went down really well as well. Um, and then I started giving talks uh, with, with titles like The Civilization is Finished. And again, I was very nervous at first, but the response was very positive. Uh, then I started teaching this way to my students, which was another kind of step further up, as it were. So I thought, God, can I really say this to young people? Uh, is that really on? Uh, and the response from students almost always positive. The students saying to me things like, it feels like the first time that any um, any adult, anyone in authority has, has really levels with me or with us, that kind of thing. So this is where I was by the summer of 2018. And in the summer of 2018, uh, three people almost simultaneously said to me, um, Rupert, there is this new group that's forming. Um, they are saying the same kind of thing to you, but they've got a plan. They've got a plan of what to do about it. So uh, they sent me to watch um, uh, Gail Bradbrook's video, uh, Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. And of course, you know, this was the onset of Extinction Rebellion. And I was electrified. I was like, oh my God, yes, this is what I've been saying, except they've got a plan as well. So I got in touch with Gail instantly and um, started to get involved with the launch of Extinction Rebellion. I helped co-organize the, uh, the uh, multi-signed letter in The Guardian, which launched, launched Extinction Rebellion publicly. Uh, and uh, I co-emceed the launch event with Gail uh, outside the House of Parliament. And I think that's a kind of answer to your question. Right. That brings us quite close to the present day and, and the sort of beginning of the essay, which we'll you know, begin to come to substantively. But I want to get back to that moment where you were hit by a kind of realization of sorts. Um, how would you describe that? Was that a kind of, you know, it sounds a bit sort of Damascene conversion like, almost like a sort of religious experience of some kind, or, or is it not that strong? Is it more like the crystallization of many years of thinking? Um, I'm keen to know like a bit more about the quality of the experience, but from that, mm. I also want you to speak to, well, as you say, you know, you know is, is civilization finished? And, and on, on what basis would you say, this civilization rather, and on what mm. basis would you say that? I have listened to a, a long lecture you've given on precisely that point, the many sub clauses in the argument, but r relatively succinctly, why should we think the civilization is finished? But first, yeah. What made you feel it and how did it feel? Yeah, so um, it was it was a bit kind of um, startling. You know, the, the, the four words, it, it was just like they arrived and they arrived kind of really kind of forcefully and they just sort of were there. And I had to, I just, I stopped, you know, I, I've been, I was walking down the street with these leaflets in my hand and I just kind of stopped. And I was like, wow, this is, this is a, this is a revelation. This is a message that, uh, that uh, some part of me or something has been trying to get through to me for some time and now it's here. And I think that many people um, in and around Extinction Rebellion uh, have had somewhat similar experiences in the last few years. For me, it was very, very sort of precise. It was the moment when I thought all this stuff that we've been trying to do, the idea of sustainable development, for example, I've been critiquing this idea for years, but I hadn't really been able to kind of escape the the pull of it. I hadn't really been able to sort of really step outside it and kind of from a, some different place, look with a vantage point and say, no, th th this is just over. There's got to be a whole new paradigm of um, activism and a whole new paradigm of civilization. The distinction you make, of course, between civilization and this civilization is integral to my argument. I'm not saying that civilization is finished. I'm saying that this civilization is finished. And the, the particular meaning that has is that if we survive what's coming without uh, our civilization collapsing, it will be because we have truly transformed it. It will look profoundly uh, different in, in its institutions, in everyday life, in the kind of thinking that is at the 
face of it. And I think that is something like the, the task that Perspectiva uh, has envisioned for itself. Um, and I think that's the right kind of uh, task. Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, that's right. We're, that's what we're trying to... We're, we're also of the view that, that making do and mend might, might buy us some time, but won't fundamentally change the inexorable collapse, incipient collapse that's already underway of the civilization as you describe it. But just to put a few words in for the skeptic or the, or the person mm, who's persuaded. Sure. Um, first of all, you know, is there really a, when you say this civilization, clarify what you mean there. Are we speaking about the West? Are we speaking about something about globalization? Is it something about capitalism? Is it something about um, the nature of political institutions? Um, is it something about the underlying so, sort of logic of consumerism? So first of all, tell me what you mean by this civilization. And secondly, I still want to be suaded, persuaded that it really is finished in the sense that you know, I don't need an IPCC report, but your most persuasive case that what's coming, as you put it, really is of that magnitude. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm really talking about of the different alternatives you gave. The closest to what I'm talking about would be globalization. So the, the, the global um, hegemonic um, uh, civilization, which is um, fairly closely identified with uh, capitalism and with uh, neoliberalism, but not exhaustively described uh, by those and not uh, exhausted uh, by those. Um, I certainly mean to include uh, growthism um, under uh, this heading. Uh, it, it is a total fantasy and a, a tragically still uh, largely hegemonic one um, that uh, the way through um, the, the coming crisis is to continue to try to uh, quote grow unquote the, uh, the economy. And one of the reasons why I think that uh, civilizational collapse is very likely is because of how far away we are from undoing that uh, dogma, even though we've made a hell of a lot of progress raising climate consciousness and raising the sense that there's something fundamentally uh, awry with our current uh, way of, uh, of doing things. Um, you know, the, the IPCC and other such institutions, they're gradually catching up with, if I may put it this way, with, uh, with people such as uh, myself. With each passing um, report, they come closer to saying, look, we are heading off uh, a cliff. Uh, and this cliff is going to be um, fundamentally damaging. It's not just going to mean that there's more disasters, which of course there will be. Uh, it's going to it's going to be a, a catastrophe at the level of uh, of fundamentals. Um, we're not going to be able to, as you put it, sort of make do and uh, and mend. Although there will be a lot of that, a lot more of that um, going on uh, in the future. Um, the IPCC, by its very nature, is a conservative uh, institution. Um, my own belief is that the IPC, most recent IPCC report is getting close now to the truth and to where things are now at. It's still not all the way there. And there's still an awful lot of uh, uh, techno-utopianism of an unfortunate kind embedded in the assumptions of the IPCC and the UN FCCC. And we're going to hear a lot about that uh, in COP over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. Um, COP is going to fail us because um, it's asking fundamentally the wrong questions. It's not asking the question, what kind of system change would we need to have in order to have a chance of sustaining ourselves uh, through what's coming and indeed, of course, uh, to, to make it be the case that somewhat less of it uh, uh, is coming to, uh, to, to hit us. Um, there's still a, a lot of, um, um, there's still a lot of optimism that, uh, that we're good, there's going to be some kind of uh, gigantic techno fix. I was debating yesterday with a proponent of, uh, of solar radiation management, the most extreme form of geoengineering. Um, I think it is quite likely uh, terrifying, uh, as it should be, to hear this, that uh, geoengineering will be implemented over the next 10 years. I think it is incredibly unlikely that that will um, save us. I, I, I'm, in fact, I'm as near as damn it certain that it will not. Um, the advocates of it say it will buy us some time, but I think that it will um, encourage us to, to carry on um, trying to keep the illusion alive that this civilization uh, is not finished. 
Uh, and in particular, if we, uh, if we do solar radiation management, i.e. if we make the, the sun a, a bit uh, dimmer by thickening uh, the atmosphere with, uh, with aerosols, um, we are creating probably a worse death sentence for uh, the oceans. Uh, and well, um, somebody, uh, some wise person said some years ago, if there were aliens visiting our planet, they wouldn't call it Earth, they would call it ocean or something like that. Um, uh, I'm increasingly persuaded that we've been giving too much attention to what's been happening on land and not enough to what's been happening in the oceans. Uh, and that even if we got everything right on land from now on, our civilization would still be finished by what's, uh, by what's uh, boiling up in the oceans. Okay, right. Wow. Okay. So um, let's try and just clarify where we are then. So although we haven't given the sort of chapter and verse on the nature of climactic breakdown from a purely scientific perspective, you know, we haven't spoken about violent weather or floods or um, heat, wa heat waves or wet bulb temperatures or any of that, but you yeah. take as a given that these things are getting worse um, and will continue to get worse unless there's a fundamental shift. And the reason you think this, this civilization is finished and by the, is that what you mean by this civilization is something that's sort of inherently ecocidal because it's ground is premised on a view of human nature and the economy and what society is for that is inexorably going to lead to collapse. And that's why the civilization is finished. What, what is still a bit unclear to me is why the techno optimists, the tech, techno utopians are necessarily wrong. Because if I could, you know, I know from conversations with you that as you say that you understand the scientific papers, um, you, you know, you've read them quite closely. You haven't just looked at the executive summaries, you speak to the scientists themselves. So I totally respect that you have done your research on this, but I wonder what you would say to those who say, look at Rupert, he's been a green all his life. He's a deep green. He's actually quite attached to the catastrophe. It's actually quite important to him that the world's falling apart. He's got motivated reasoning here. Maybe things are not that bad. How do you begin to respond to that? Well, just before I get to that, just a, a word on the on the scientists. Um, I think that um, something which is really useful for people to understand if you're not um, close to anyone who's involved in climate science, etc., um, is that if you talk to climate scientists off the record, they will almost invariably say um, it's worse uh, than we say, let alone than the IPCC say, um, because we only say what we can prove. And what we actually think is going to happen is uh, considerably worse than that. And this is, of course, a massive reason for why we need the precautionary principle uh, and a demonstration of how we haven't been uh, having it. Um, to the motivated reasoning point, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say because go back to my story at the start. Um, I think that virtually every single one of us, possibly every single one of us, and certainly myself, are very motivated not to say and think the kinds of things that I've been, um, I found myself sort of forced to say and think over the past uh, five uh, years. You know, for many, many years, uh, for, for all sorts of good reasons to do with, uh, you know, wanting to preserve hope and a sort of meaningful story and, and, uh, and let alone, you know, properties such as uh, Korea and so on and so forth. For many, many years, I think that I resisted uh, these conclusions. I was motivated not to uh, entertain these conclusions, or at least not to uh, believe them. And I think that that is still the main motivation for most people. So take the political party to which I belong, the Green Party, for example. It's incredibly hard for the Green Party to embrace any of these thoughts. People say, oh, Green Party's a, Green Party people are sort of doom-mongering people and so on. But actually, if you actually look at Green Party policy, if you look at what Greens say in um, uh, party political broadcasts or whatever, 98% of the time, what they say is, oh, we can do it, we can fix it. Yes, we can. Here are the policies we need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's an incredible wrench to say to Greens, you know, maybe it's time for us to admit that the historic enterprise of green politics has failed. Uh, and that the idea that we could save the world by getting voted into power just is not credible anymore. And that's what I'm seeking to say to my green colleagues now. And it's a very difficult, uh, very difficult ask. So I think I would turn it around and say, um, no, I think the motivated reasoning um, is is largely pointing the other way. Now, of course, it's not quite as simple as that. There is something um, attractive about uh, doomism, 
Um, there is something attractive about really uh, giving up um, uh, because then you have a sort of, you're part of a sort of secret uh, cabal. Um, you've seen the truth that no one else is willing to see. Um, and uh, most crucially, you're absolved from having to do very much about it. Um, uh, but that's not what, where I stand, right? I'm in this incredibly painful position of saying it's still just about possible for us actually to escape uh, this doom. Uh, it's almost the worst possible position uh, to be in. You're sort of, you know, continually kind of um, um, yeah. trying to hold on to, to that desperate remnant of hope and not being able to to, to let go of it, you know, be, be truly not being able to let go of it, because I don't believe that we know the future. And, you know, this is where I disagree with my brilliant uh, friend and colleague, Jen Bendel, who, by the way, of course, is not at all in favor of giving up. He's in favor of doing deep adaptation. Um, but where I disagree with him is in his sort of insistence that collapse is certain uh, and his desire to put a, a time limit on it. Uh, I don't think we can put a time on it, and I don't think we can know that it's uh, that it's certain any more than uh, the the many um, people who claim to be certain um, that it's certainly not uh, going to happen, even even now. So I actually think that th this position of kind of uncertainty, and I hope a certain kind of humility, you know, it's quite difficult. Um, but it, it, the what what the last few years have taught, I think, very strongly, and they certainly taught me. Um, is that there is a huge premium on, on telling the truth. There is a huge pre premium on um, authentically expressing uh, where we are at, how one sees things, etc. That is why my work started really resonating more from 2016 onward than it ever had done before. That is why Extinction Rebellion succeeded when all the powers that be and all the sort of established green groups said, you're bound to fail. That is why Greta Thunberg has the incredible cut through that she has. So here's the thing, um, yes to, mo to the vast majority of that. What I'm trying to get at is that in a few weeks time or in some ways already it's happening, you have a kind of technocratic uh, approach to climate change happening in Glasgow um, where you have many of the world leaders although sadly by no means all of them um, coming together to discuss everything from energy policy, uh, energy policy to infrastructure to climate finance and so forth. And they're driven by this kind of hope that things can um, get better in sufficient time to avert the worst of what's to come. Your view is, it seems to be, the underlying logic is so flawed, so delusional, that they're wasting their time? Or is it rather that they that they're, will inevitably go too slowly? Or is it somehow that things are already much too far gone for that kind of approach to make a difference? Mm. Well, it's complicated. I mean, some of the things that they could do um, would make things um, less bad, um, and that would be uh, great. Um, then again, uh, some of the things that they're probably going to going to do uh, could uh, make things even worse. So it is possible. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm not. You know, I don't have my ear terribly close to the ground to the ground of the negotiations. Uh, in a week's time, I'll be better placed to answer this question. But it is possible that at Glasgow there'll be a big push for BEX, so for uh, bioenergy and carbon sequestration, basically uh, building. Uh, uh, I, I, that's an interesting Freudian slip. Building forests and uh, and uh, and burning them and storing uh, the carbon. Um, you know, if that's the path we go down, then we almost certainly, uh, as the brilliant work of Biofuel Watch and others has shown, we almost certainly accelerate our path uh, into uh, cataclysm. So some of what they're going to do is going to be irrelevant. Uh, some of it can make things uh, better if they do real stuff for renewables, for example, if they get anywhere close to where they need to get in terms of climate finance and adaptation finance. Looks like that isn't going to happen, which might even mean that there's no agreement uh, reached at Glasgow, that is a, you know, that's a sort of nuclear uh, scenario that, that could, could occur. Um, and some of what they do will probably be positively bad. There'll be a lot of corporations there trying to basically say, 
um, political leaders have failed, it's time to hand over to us. And there's a nugget of truth in that. There's much that could be done now by, by businesses. There are some businesses that are better intentional uh, now than, uh, than many of our so-called uh, leaders. There's also immense danger in, in that kind of narrative as well. So, you know, a lot of what this is about is, if you will, strategic storytelling. Again, it's the kind of thing that I think Perspectiva is quite uh, and rightly um, interested in. And one of the key reasons um, I'm going to be in Glasgow for the whole time is to attempt to be involved of, in the narration of what happens. I think it is really crucial to understand uh, and to enable the world to understand how our so-called leaders are not and how they are uh, going to be failing us. If they manage to truly surprise me, you know, there'll be no one who's more delighted than, than myself. And I've, I've set out in the, in the 10 tests that, uh, that uh, myself and colleagues in Greens can have argued for, uh, what it would be to have an at least sort of minimally successful COP. I will be very surprised if they meet that threshold. So we need to be narrating uh, and sense making in relation uh, to this. Uh, and we need to be marking the historic moment, which I think will be a moment for further huge awakening, a further, a further coming into climate consciousness of a huge new phalanx of people, um, which will be the, uh, the end of the COP and, and they're failing us and a lot of people realizing that. Right, so that's where I want to go to next, because obviously that's the, the content of the essay and what we, we've really come here to get to. I just wanted to take some time to establish a bit about where you're coming from, why you're coming from there, what the prevailing narrative is, why it's probably not right, what to expect from COP, what not to expect. And, and in light of that, what comes next? So this is where I want to speak to your experience with Extinction Rebellion. And I watched you on Question Time at the time when it was in quite close to its kind of peak of impact. Yeah. You've spoken a great deal about the successes of um, Extinction Rebellion, but also to some extent the failures. So can you tell us, from having been very close to the inner, inner circle and speaking on Extinction Rebellion's behalf, what you think was necessary and what they got right, but where they began to go astray perhaps too? Yeah, so as you uh, as you point out, Jonathan, this is um, this is uh, the sort of starting point of the essay I've done for you all in uh, in Perspectiva. Um, so as I've already implied, I think Extinction Rebellion was a completely necessary development um, and a brilliantly uh, successful one in roughly the following sense. Um, over the period from when we launched it in uh, October of 2018 through to April, May 2019, the culmination of the of the first uh, rebellion. Um, Extinction Rebellion did pretty much exactly what it planned to do, uh, and it succeeded in creating a huge uh, upsurge of, uh, of climate consciousness uh, in the UK, uh, and to some extent in other countries as well. Um, and just, 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 I mean, proves the wrong word. I'm persuaded of that, so you don't need to sort of convince me, but again, yeah. thinking of those who are maybe, you know, aesthetically or politically you know, perturbed by Extinction Rebellion, who mm -hmm. feel they somehow went too far or they're exaggerating or whatever they think. Can you, you know, when you say there was a huge upsurge, is, are there any sort of indicators of that that at least, if, don't, if it doesn't prove it, at least can suggest it? Yeah, so there's, there's polling data, some of which I cite in the, uh, in the essay. Uh, obviously, um, Extinction Rebellion wasn't the whole of what was happening. Um, it was also the fact that there was a sort of wonderful confluence uh, in April uh, 2019. Uh, David Attenborough's Climate Change the Facts uh, TV program um, was one of those very few TV, TV programs that really, I think, made a difference immediately. Um, Greta um, came over in April uh, 2019 to be part of, um, uh, of our rebellion, and that was very uh, important. And the, the, and the more general kind of the way that the climate school climate strikes worldwide had been raising um, attention and interest was, was sort of starting to peak around the same time. Um, but uh, I think it's it, it's absurd to pretend that it's coincidence that uh, that the polls suddenly shot up um, basically on kind of climate etc indicators uh, in late April and May uh, 2019. Um, my reading uh, of what happened is that well the XR strategy worked. What the strategy was was to force a, a national public uh, conversation, um, which for about the first uh, three or four days consisted mostly of people saying, this is terrible. Uh, and then it seemed like kind of over the weekend, 
people were kind of thinking maybe something a bit like, hmm, well, got to sort of admire their staying power. They're still there on the streets. And um, and and uh, more XR people were having more opportunities to um, authentically express what they were feeling, why they were doing it, et cetera, in the media. By the time of the second week, you got um, William Haig writing uh, in, uh, in the Times saying, well, you know what, um, XR are kind of are showing us something here and the Conservatives need to wise up, otherwise they'll be left behind. He had a bunch of, of business people writing to the Times saying, oh, we think XR are right. Um, and of course, the, the, the crucial indicator really that the XR strategy was working is not just the, the polls, it's the fact that all three of the XR demands were basically, were basically on a symbolic level um, and it's a very important point here, not in reality, but on a symbolic level, uh, achieved or part achieved uh, then or over the next few months. So um, demand one to tell the truth, which was interpreted widely as making climate and nature emergency declarations. So Parliament, the day after uh, myself and others in the XR delegation met with uh, the government on uh, May the 1st, 2019, Parliament declared a symbolic climate and environment emergency. The second demand, um, Act Now, which was widely interpreted as go to uh, net zero carbon emissions, that summer um, um, Parliament uh, legislated for net zero carbon. Um, admittedly, the date they went for was 2050 rather than 2025, but they still did it and it was a world first. And the third demand was to upgrade democracy, uh, which is widely interpreted as uh, meaning we needed to have citizens assemblies on climate. And that summer Parliament initiated a citizens assembly on climate, which reported back with excellent recommendations, even though its terms of reference were not that great, and even though it didn't have the formal power which XR had asked for. So on the symbolic level, uh, all three of XR's demands were achieved within months of the April rebellion. I think that uh, early that summer was really though um, the high watermark in retrospect for XR. The October rebellion uh, was much bigger uh, and achieved a lot of, uh, uh, of media hits and so on, but it didn't achieve any sort of further cut through. Uh, and when you had the, the tube action towards the end of that rebellion, uh, that in retrospect, I think was the moment where XR, um, it became impossible for XR to carry on growing. Um, and its image was formed in the, the mind of the British public as an organization that, uh, that went too far um, and ever since then, XR has been doing all sorts of excellent things, uh, but it's been uh, gradually uh, losing uh, numbers and losing reach. Um, and well, people have, have gone one of two ways with it, really. Either they've tried to escalate further uh, within XR or through things like um, Insulate Britain, um, or they're moving in, as it were, the opposite direction. And that, of course, is the direction which I've sought to crystallize in my moderate flank essay. And a lot of um, people who were very prominent or active in XR are very prominent among those who have been kicking off organizations which count as being in my moderate flank. So organizations like Lawyers for Net Zero, uh, Wildcard, Trust the People, Climate Emergency Centers, transformative ad adaptation. These are all, have all been formed by people who are at the heart of the XR project. And they're, and they're among the organizations that I take as the sort of um, demonstration cases for my so-called moderate flank. So um, let's come to them in a, in a second, but there's an important point here in the, in the essay that one of the things that I particularly liked about it was the analysis of the kind of underlying social movement theory that XR were, was premised on in some ways um, that, that you feel sort of somehow mis misunderstands the specificity of the climate problem mm -hmm. in that much of social movement theory historically is grounded in a particular opponent, a particular localized context, um, as a kind of oppression perhaps, and various sort of signals that say, in order to shift this, you need a certain number of people and you need to get arrested and so forth, whatever the theory is, and you were saying that some of that was transported onto the climate challenge, but maybe in a way that didn't accurately reflect what climate challenge actually is. Yeah. Can you talk more about that, please. Yeah. So since early days in Extinction Rebellion, I've said, look, uh, 
I'm a bit uncomfortable with this kind of idea, which is very good for morale, uh, that all one needs is 3.5% of the population. This comes from Erica Chenoweth's uh, research. Um, if you have that on side, um, well, then you're going to win. Um, uh, this is problematic in various ways that I've, that I've written about um, in the essay and elsewhere, including uh, in my book, uh, Extinction Rebellion Insights from the Inside. Um, uh, one of the ways it's problematic is, as you say, that it seems to be designed for um, campaigns or uh, issues where there is a sort of definite specified win um, after which uh, you can sort of go back to business as usual in a certain sense. So, for, exa for example, if you interpret the civil rights movement as a movement which was trying to enable black people to get the same kind of rights and opportunities in the United States as white people, then it was possible for it to win uh, um, as a result of a certain um, 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 definable set of changes in the law uh, and for it to then kind of say, right, we won uh, and now basically black people are included in the same system that they were excluded from uh, before and we can all kind of go on together. Um, necessarily, if we're really serious, and this goes back of course to what we were saying 20 minutes or so ago, if we're really serious about the climate crisis, uh, it's not like that because it's about changing the whole system. It's not about including some bunch of excluded people. It's about saying, if we get everyone included, we still haven't even really got to first base <laughs> in terms of um, changing the, the way that, uh, that we relate to um, our life support system, in terms of changing the way that uh, we relate to, to nature, in terms of changing the way we think about all these things. A useful analogy might be the Indian independence movement, which of course another, is, is another of the examples that is, uh, that is cited. Um, so the Indian independence movement, if you interpret, nar it, interpret it narrowly as this was about the Indians kicking the British out, uh, and gaining the right to, to vote and in some sense decide their own uh, destiny, then it won. But of course, that wasn't actually what Gandhi was trying to uh, achieve. What Gandhi was trying to achieve was a kind of total perspective uh, shift and philosophy shift mm -hmm. that he outlined in his brilliant early book, uh, Hind Swaraj. And by that measure, it's absolutely clear that the Indian independence movement did not uh, succeed if that was your measure. Um, well, it's something like that that the climate movement is trying to achieve, something uh, a lot bigger and a lot more um, demanding. For system change, you are gonna need, this, so there's two aspects to this. The system, and they're related, but they're not quite the same. For system change, you are gonna need um, a huge plurality or probably majority to be basically on side. So um, it's, um, it's absurd to think, Oh, well, if we have 3.5% for us and 96.5% against us, we can still uh, win. Um, uh, and the, the second way of putting this is, um, it's also extremely implausible that you're gonna get a win if that's the case um, anyway. The way I see it is if you're trying to mobilize 3.5% or 0.3.5% or whatever your theory says, that better be the tip of a much larger iceberg and part of what I'm trying to talk about when I talk about the need to mobilize a much larger moderate flank is we need to create more of that iceberg or bring more of that iceberg above, uh, above the water uh, uh, into action. So system change, um, the kind of response that we actually need to be credible um, uh, in preventing our civilization from uh, crashing um, uh, and perhaps crashing terminally um, is clearly going to require many people to be on side anyway. And that's why I talk a lot about, for example, change in the, in the workplace. Um, but also um, in order to get the change in the first place, um, uh, it was never credible to think that if you sort of mechanistically kind of go for getting 3.5% uh, on side, um, that you're actually gonna succeed in, in doing it. Uh, you're, you're bound to need a much larger kind of cohort kind of buoying up any radical flank. And I think that XR um, to try to maintain morale at times um, allowed itself to think it doesn't matter if we alienate um, vast numbers of people. Uh, so long as we mobilize um, a hard core. Uh, and I think that's the same kind of mistake that uh, Insulate Britain uh, has now made. And, you know, it's too soon to say Insulate Britain may turn out to have changed the, um, the, the, um, the vibes uh, around this crucial issue of insulation in, in, 
in this country and uh, people may reluctantly come around to uh, backing it despite hating the, the methods and so on and so forth. But let's put it this way, I'm very skeptical. And, and the question I want to ask anyone sort of um, tuned in enough and turned on enough to be watching uh, this, uh, this conversation uh, is, is your, is your best way forward now um, to uh, get involved in um, escalation within XR or within Insulate Britain or whatever? Or might it be better for you to get involved in seeking to engage in uh, leadership within the broad terrain of what I'm calling the moderate flank? And that's what the people who are doing, who I mentioned earlier, that's what the, the people uh, are doing who have created organizations like Lloyds for Net Zero, like climate emergency centers and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and part of the point of my Perspectiva essay uh, is to say, yay, um, maybe that's what, uh, what more of us should be doing. Great, thank you. That was a very extensive answer. And uh, the essay also gives chapter and verse and roughly what you just said. Um, I'm quite keen to get to the moderate flank. I can see you're, you're eager to get it in yourself as well. Um, I suppose we can give examples and you've, you've listed some, but if you could flesh them out a bit. So lawyers for net zero, what do they do exactly? Um, you know, parents for a future, what's going on there? If we can start to make this a bit vivid. Yeah. Also, I'd also like to... flawed what is the social movement theory that you're offering oh my unstable yes yeah, so i lost you for a second there but i think i got the gist of it um i'll try and answer and correct me if i if i missed anything if i missed anything key um so look um extinction rebellion was formed explicitly as a radical flank uh it was it's formed explicitly as outriders to greenpeace friends of the earth the national trust the green party etc et uh, and as I uh, argued earlier, I think it's clear that in that sense it succeeded. Uh, and the suggestion I'm making in my essay really uh, is that perhaps the most potent effect of that success and the concomitant success of the Sunrise Movement in the US and of uh, Friday to Future in, in Europe and so forth um, is to have created more space for more people to move into. Uh, and I think it's implicit already in what we said 15, 20 minutes or so, that it's pretty much certain that roughly speaking, the climate movement is going to grow a lot uh, in the coming years. And there may be a huge boost to it um, after the end of COP. You know, some people will probably drop out with, uh, with burnout, but I think they'll be more than replaced with huge numbers of people who will be outra outraged, dismayed, scared by the growing realization there are no, um, adults in the room, there is no cavalry, um, they're, they're, um, they're willing to, to see us all, to see us all go down because they're not willing to see beyond the paradigm of the current civilization. They're not willing to question growth. They're not willing to, to question um, techno-optimism. Uh, they're not willing to um, take risks uh, as they see it in um, moving swiftly to dismantle the fossil um, economy. Um, so the climate movement is set to hugely grow. Um, what we don't want to do is put obstacles in its way. Uh, so this is this is crucially about being inclusive. And that has a number of dimensions which I explore in the essay uh, and I'm exploring another work at, at the present time. Uh, so one dimension is to be cautious about being too uh, full on uh, about um, uh, leftist or um, intersectionalist or similar kinds of particular um, framings that come from a particular place of what the task is. If you basically say um, to be involved in the climate movement, you have to be a socialist or to be involved in the climate movement, you have to be an advocate of intersectionalist identity politics, then you are making it very difficult for uh, many of the people who will want to join uh, this movement to do so. So that's one dimension of inclusivity. Another dimension of inclusivity is if is this. If you say to people who want to join the climate movement, you have to be willing to be arrested or at least to support others who are basically about doing nonviolent direct action, then again, you're setting the bar pretty high. Um, you know, I want there to be uh, organizations that continue to do nonviolent direct action. Absolutely, I want that. And I think that they will grow. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm still involved in nonviolent direct action myself. And for many people on this call, perhaps, um, if you haven't done it yet, you know, think about doing it. It's uh, more, we need more people to do that. But what we also need is a hell of a lot more people to really step up and do something which is a little bit short of that. So yeah, what kinds of things do I have in mind? 
Well, as you implied already, one of my key frames here is the frame of Parents for a Future. So that's what's in uh, this book and it's been kindly already put in the, in the chat. Uh, and basically in Parents for a Future, I say, look, surely the challenge that um, the school climate strikers, uh, Fridays for Future have sort of thrown down to the older generation is, um, we are calling on you to save our world because there isn't time for us to save it. You know, Theresa May famously said, you know, they should be in school learning how to be engineers and uh, teachers and so on and so forth. And then they can make the, the new and better world. There isn't time for that. So adults have to step up. So what Parents for a Future is saying is, what if we got a huge number of parents who are actually and actively thinking, what do I need to do in, in order to secure for my children a future? Uh, and with a, an understanding that it, is, that it is still possible to buy your child a, a good education or whatever, but it is no longer possible to buy your child a secure uh, future uh, because the kinds of crises that are coming, the kinds of disasters that are coming and so on, the, the heat dome in the United States, the wildfires in Australia, the, the, the floods in Germany this year, all of those three things unprecedented, they are but a small taste of what is, what is coming. Uh, and it is gonna collapse our civilization unless we do something uh, dramatic uh, about it. So what if parents were to, were to put on their hats together as parents for uh, a future and, and think about what they actually meant and act accordingly? You know, that would be revolutionary. Rupert, as a, I mean, so a, as a parent, and I'm sure there are many others watching who are, um, you know, yes. And yet I also live on a street where I know that my neighbors who are also parents will be quite bought into, you know, some, I, I know a neighbor down the street who's a, um, a consultant, an energy consultant, often working with fossil fuel companies. Uh -huh. And I know that people who are still very attached to the logic of economic growth, who still think they can deal with this problem technocratically. And um, so it's, it, it's not so obvious to me that the, the, and this comes to the broader question of movement language and activist language. Now, I know mm. you're aware of some of the limitations there. Yeah. But I can think of lots of people who want a future for their children and a good one who, A, are still caught up in the paradigm, as you put it, of how we see the world, and B, really don't want to be part of anything resembling a movement. So mm. what's, how, what's the story for how you reach them? Yeah, good. So so two, two things, really, sort of two-pronged approach. Firstly, I think that we need a, a, a real kind of parents movement. It exists to some extent in Germany through Fridays for Future and through Parents for Future. And it exists to a small extent um, uh, in, in this country. Uh, we need more parents to step up as parents to, to create a movement to become activists. But secondly, we need something else as well. Um, to be truly inclusive, as you imply, we're going to need to move beyond the language of activism. And we're going to need, I think, probably to move beyond the language of movements as well. Um, we're going to need to find ways of uh, enabling people to understand, feel included in and get involved in um, forms of action uh, and change um, that, uh, that don't require them to uh, think that they're, well, that they're like me um, or you know, like some of the other people uh, on this call. Um, so um, in calling for um, this, this moderate flank, I'm saying I want people to be thinking of actively and creating stuff which goes beyond uh, what was already um, present in um, the RSPB, in um, uh, Friends of the Earth, uh, in whatever sort of been there for a long time, you know, organizations doing good work but uh, who haven't managed to, to, uh, to shift, the, uh, shift the paradigm, um, certainly, and haven't even managed to move the Overton window in the way that, uh, that XR did. But, but that the will stop considerably short of, um, uh, of what XR is calling for from people. So what are some concrete examples of that? So the two main ones that I develop in the essay are change through the workplace and change through our uh, communities. So change through the workplace, I think there is, um, enormous scope for, for workplace-based actions of, of, of various kinds. Um, we could imagine um, actions um, that consist in trying to uh, basically green what the organization uh, does uh, in terms of greening its uh, supply chain, reducing yeah. commuting. Rupert, just say again, I'm just keen to get the voice in of those who are not in the room. And yeah. I can think of many people who say that's already happening in spades. You know, sustainable businesses all over the shop. Um, mm. 
Yeah, yeah, some of it's absolutely some of it's happening. Yeah. Who has a climate system, you know, conversation with their kids? Like, what is the order of magnitude shift that you're invoking here um, that would actually lead to a, a sort of significant seismic impact? Yes. So look, what I'm trying to get at is it is it needs to be a, a, a sort of full spectrum response. So maybe you start with those kinds of things, but then there are there are slightly more challenging questions like um, what is the, your firm doing with its uh, profits? Um, uh, what actually is the core business um, of your of your firm, uh, and is that itself uh, uh, problematic? Then there are important kind of side questions like um, how does your firm um, regard um, um, activism or or at least sort of workplace based action? Does it have a positive kind of openness towards um, initiative from stakeholders such as employees? Does it allow um, uh, employees to go on to, on climate strikes uh, with their kids or to go to demonstrations. That's an important set of uh, uh, of questions. And then ultimately, um, what I think you get is is one of two things happening. Either uh, you start to get you know changes on all these kinds of different um, uh, dimensions, and they start going in the right direction, and they start adding up, or you start getting resistances to those. And if you start getting resistances to those, that would be the time, it seems to me, to invoke um, um, stoppages and potentially uh, strikes. Um, and that, of course, is getting somewhat full on, although still not necessarily as full on as actually um, uh, getting arrested, uh, especially if you can if you can do a stoppage in a way such that it doesn't um, violate the trade union laws uh, uh, that we have. And that is quite possible to do, for example, if you do short um targeted uh, stoppages so there's a kind of there's a kind of spectrum here which i'm inviting people uh into um and uh, I, I think that that it's a space which yes people are starting to occupy it i'm kind of i'm drawing attention to it and drawing attention to those people who are starting to occupy it and urging it to be a step changed up okay so you mentioned this is the last question for me because i want to open up and, and actually already if i can encourage the audience if you have a question do share it in the chat and um, we're coming to that now. Um, there's there's a lot more I want to ask you, but, but um, you know, I'm keen to understand when you say tell the truth, what exactly you mean, more from a philosophical point of view in this context. I'm also keen to understand what you mean by transformative ad adaptation. Yeah. What I really want to ask you is you, you spoke about getting arrested and um, you're on trial on Thursday. And just in case I don't get a chance at the end, um, what, what what would lead you to think that it's worth, you could potentially go to jail. And can you tell us a little bit about what's at stake there um, and whether you'd encourage other people to do the same thing or not? Yes, yeah, so I, I totally encourage other people to do the same thing. Um, uh, and uh, I, I guess for, for, for a number of people, perhaps on this call, um, what it would be to step out of their comfort zone to take the next uh, step up would be to go all the way to nonviolent direct action, which is an incredibly empowering, beautiful, and liberating thing to be involved in. By the way, it's it's a, it's an, an amazing experience to have. Quite apart from the actual um, good that it does, what I'm also saying is that for some people, what it would be to step out of their comfort zone um, would be to take a step back from that into thinking about how they might lead some of these sort of more moderate flank type activities. In other words, there's quite a lot of that people, quite a lot of people who have been involved in say Extinction Rebellion, um, who um, it, for them it's comfortable to be doing nonviolent direct action, to be a campaigner, activist, speaking truth to power, out on the streets, et cetera, and maybe slightly more challenging to move into the more moderate flank style space. But the, as I say, those people who have done that from XR and who have formed Lawyers for Net Zero or Wildcard or the Climate Emergency Centers movement, I think they are also doing the right thing. And that's a, a great way to, to step out of their uh, comfort zone. So turning to my um, trial, um, so I'm on trial for having um, protested uh, using um, nonviolent direct action last year uh, in the September rebellion at 55 Tufton Street, which as some of you may know, is the home of some of the UK's um, least perspectiva-like think tanks. Uh, some of the most uh, nefarious um, lobbying uh, organizations with at the head of that crowd, uh, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, N Nigel Lawson and so on, the top climate denial um, so-called think tank uh, in the UK formed three days after the hack of the University of East Anglia uh, in 2009, 
coincidence? Uh, I think not. Um, uh, in which, by the way, my emails were among those that were um, hacked. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, my colleagues, uh, Claire Farrell and Jessica Townsend, sprayed uh, lies, lies, lies in um, chalk spray onto the walls of the building. Uh, and I poured um, a fake blood, water soluble, you know, just wash it straight off, would have washed off with the rain uh, over the steps to represent uh, the blood on the hands of, uh, of, these, uh, of these climate deniers. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we're likely to be found uh, guilty. I probably won't uh, go to prison. This is my first offense. I'll probably get a fine. Um, and uh, it's quite it's quite scary. It's it's quite boring and time consuming. It's quite uh, exciting. Um, I didn't feel I had any alternative. I'd been in Extinction Rebellion for for two years uh, without having uh, uh, got arrested. Uh, and um, well, I, I've campaigned for such a long time uh, against uh, climate denial, uh, and um, I really felt like I had to go this uh, this extra mile. Uh, and yeah, that's what I'll be trying to explain to the uh, to the judge on Thursday. Okay, thank you. Well, obviously, good luck, um, if that's the right expression. Um, it's intense, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. know that. That's not, not no small thing. Um, there's a question, a big grand question, and I'm very glad to have my kind of perspective, a colleague here, Mark Vernon, to ask it. Mark, do you want to unmute yourself and share the, the question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for all you've been saying. It's very fascinating to think about, um, as well as alarming and all the rest. Um, but I wonder whether you've thought about what societal or even civilizational transformation actually involves. Um, when I think about civilization changing in the past, say with the emergence of Christianity or with the Industrial Revolution, I think one of the deep things it requires is a new ontology, to throw in another word, um, but you know another sense of what it actually is to be human, um, or at least the way that the world is. You know whether it's the birth of something like materialism and so on. Yeah. Now, um, it feels a bit silly to ask that how you might foster such a thing even, but maybe maybe it's a bit better. You know, are there signs of? Um, is there any sign of, of something new emerging like that that can be kind of uh, amplified, articulated, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, um, even just spotted <laughs> yeah. um, when it comes to um, civilizational, well, so, say societal change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and really good to, to meet you in this way. Um... So obviously there's a number of dimensions to this vast uh, question, which I know a number of you have, have been thinking about in one way or another. Uh, I have tried to talk about this uh, uh, here and there, for example, in my book, The Civilization is Finished. Um, one key aspect of it uh, is that uh, the future will be more local. Um, that is uh, certainty in my view. Um, it may take a while, but that is where we're headed. Uh, it will be more local because we will have we will turn quite a lot of globalization into reverse um, more or less deliberately um, or it'll be more local because if society collapses it's more local um, uh, th there may be all sorts of non-localities along the way like there might be very powerful warlords and so forth but um, one way or another the future is going to be more uh, local so uh, that's a sort of um, that's a, a key example of uh, where we are heading and where we need to head uh, more deliberately. Um, that's quite interesting in, in a number of ways, obviously, in that, for example, it means that when we're talking about um, a successor civilization to this civilization, we, we, it's very unlikely that we're really gonna be talking about just one successor civilization. It, it seems to me almost certain that it's gonna be a number uh, they may um, involve um, cross-fertilization with um, existing um, indigenous civilizations and um, peasant civilizations, which still exist on this planet uh, in significant numbers. They're just not the majority um, anymore. Uh, to give another um, dimension of answering the question, um, 
my work is increasingly moving in the direction of uh, an interest in um, spirituality and eco-spirituality. One of the most encouraging books I've read in recent years is um, Bron Taylor's book, Dark Green Religion, um, which uh, made me think that actually uh, a shift in a more eco-spiritual direction is to some extent uh, happening um, to quite a large extent uh, under the radar. Um, but you can see sort of um, little kind of symptoms of it in the in the rise of things like uh, rebel wisdom uh, and you know i know that a number of people on this call are involved in in aspects of this um, potential or, as or actual shift um, i believe it's very likely that if there is um, a, a non-catastrophic future uh, it will involve eco-spirituality or eco-spiritualities in quite significant ways. And you could see this as a kind of return to, to animism. Uh, I think it's quite likely to be um, uh, to involve a kind of uh, 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 resurgence of or, or um, growth of a kind of uh, pantheism. Um, I was encouraged by the success of, uh, of Avatar, which uh, modeled some of these ideas, uh, and it seems pretty clear uh, if you look for example at, at fan sites um, that part of the incredible resonance that Avatar achieved uh, was because of this uh, aspect uh, of its um, of the immersive experience that it tried to to offer in an alter something like an alternative paradigm uh, and I've, I've written and published about this uh, elsewhere so you know there's much much more we could uh, we could talk about including you know getting into more concrete detail on how to how to foster these things which isn't straightforward but yeah two of the key things i would pull out would be uh the local uh and uh, eco spirituality thanks a lot for the question and the answer Rupert. i'm um i'm waiting to for for another good question there's a few that are quasi questions but i think i think i want maybe a, a line about this telling the truth idea because you know you're a professional philosopher, and it's one of Extinction Rebellion's key demands. And I think, you know, anyone who's done sort of even first year undergraduate philosophy knows the truth is inherently contested and you know perspectival and yada yada yada. Very many ways of speaking of what it means to say the truth. And yet, nonetheless, there is the demand: tell the truth. Mm. So you know, as a philosopher, does it make you uncomfortable, or on the contrary, does it make you proud that this is one of the demands? Mm. Yeah, I think it's I think it's more the the latter, really. Um, of course, there are always uh, complexities. Of course, there's always more than one um, story. Um, and um, when I talk about telling the truth, I don't necessarily kind of capitalize the 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 T in uh, in truth. You know, um, it's it's fundamentally about uh, truthfulness, of course, um, but it's also fundamentally uh, about um, facing up to to climate reality and overcoming denial. And this again, again it connects with my with my trial, right? This is why I I'm so passionate about the absurdities and obscenities of uh, of climate denial and how they have uh, hobbled us and to some extent still continue to hobble us uh, uh, even now. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's never going to be um, one uh, um, story or um, um, for example, with regard to eco-spirituality, I don't think that the future is, involves everyone in the world uh, coming to have the same um, eco-spiritual orientation. I think that's a completely absurd idea. Uh, I don't think it involves everyone in the world coming to have any eco-spiritual orientation at all. Um, I think it uh, involves a lot of people coming to have some form or another of eco-spiritual orientation. Uh, I think it involves some overlap uh, between them. Um, uh, something like the kind of thing that John Rawls means by an overlapping consensus, although not as the basis for there being a society at all. Um, I think that, that, that Rawls doesn't understand the extent to which we are um, fundamentally uh, social beings and we're sort of always already uh, in a kind of uh, collectivity and, and interbeing. Um, and that, of course, is, is, is part of the very eco-spirituality that I mean to be uh, gesturing at. Um, so in terms of the kind of way that my old teacher Richard Rorty would have uh, put things, um, uh, certain kinds of narratives of kind of uh, the truth which we all converge on um, are not necessarily um, 
uh, something we can take seriously uh, anymore. Um, but talking about truth um, with a small t, um, truth as opposed to uh, lies, uh, truthfulness as opposed to inauthenticity, this I think is absolutely fundamental to the prospect of uh, continued uh, human existence. So um, I agree, and I think it's uh, it's um, it's quite difficult. It's almost uh, you know the the, the postmodernist in me is troubled by the idea of telling the truth because I can immediately feel from whose perspective it looks different, north and south, young and old, um, and it depends on the scientific lens and it depends upon. Um, so, but I also recognize that we're a bit beyond that too. That there is a kind of mm. Once you assimilate all of that perspective, there's still a point where you get to where we're obliged to sort of convey probabilistically and from a perspectival vantage point, nonetheless, the balance of evidence is very strongly saying that this is the case, that the truth is you know, troublesome and, 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 and something we have to reckon with and contend with. Yeah. So just on, just on that, Jonathan, um, so... The, the, my philosophical perspective here is, above all, a Wittgensteinian one uh, and not a, a postmodernist one. And in this way, I've always argued against uh, postmodernism. And I think at its best, even someone like Rorty um, uh, was critical of postmodernism for this kind of reason, that I think that the, the trends that were central to postmodernism did make it easy for people to get away with all sorts of bullshit um, for a long time about the, the, the about, about what was going on in the world in, in simple, plain um, terms. And there's a dangerous sort of, there's a dangerous way in which postmodernism can be an apologia, apologia for, you know, for Trumpism or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, I think, I think what we need now is a sort of, not too kind of overbearing and not kind of too metaphysical or whatever, but still um, very sort of uh, resolutely committed um, search for uh, for truth, for for reality, for authenticity, for um, coming together around what we can uh, come together on, for for understanding what unites us rather than what uh, divides us. That's part of my mission in the in the Parents for a Future uh, uh, book. Um, I, I think it's it's desperately needed at this time when um, we've been driven uh, apart by social media algorithms and uh, and big money. Uh, and and various other things which people on this call will be familiar with. You know, I, I that's granted, and I and just to clarify, I'm not coming from a particularly postmodernist perspective either. It's just that I recognise the culture at large is you know wary of language of truth, capital T, and will resist it with all its fury. Mm. Which is not to say there isn't some underlying truth there to be said or a yeah. practical view of it or any other kind of view of it. Um, there's a question here from Evil that's actually very different in nature. And he's asked me to ask it. So um, it's, it comes back to what we spoke about, Rupert, when we met about how much you trust human beings, I think. Um, because often it comes down to this mobilizing a moderate flank, the people need to rise before the seas do and so forth. There is often a tacit trust that human beings at their best will somehow find a way towards the truth, towards the right kind of action. But how exactly, and the way the question's framed in that context is, how can the politicization and tribalization trap be avoided? Could becoming a moderate flankist of the kind you call for go the same way that mask wearing became a politicized master in the US? For example, along a Trump supporter versus soya latte drinking liberal divide, yeah. rather than as a rational non-political choice. Because sometimes you're talking as if people will somehow see the light, there will be this emerging climate movement, people will realize the grown-ups won't save us, and it will be somehow harmonious and yeah. But, but that but but what we've learned in recent history is polarization is endemic and, and it's amplified and structurally incentivized. So how do we avoid that in this context? Yeah, yeah, really important question. So um, my main answer to the question is that uh, the risk can't be entirely avoided and that may be what happens. What you have to try to do is deliberately build in bulwarks as strong as possible to stop it from happening. Now, one of the interesting things about Extinction Rebellion is that for all its radicalism, um, it did try to do that. It did really seek, and I've written about this, uh, it did really seek to be broad based. And that was kind of wonderful. It did seek to move, quote, beyond party politics and quote, beyond ideology. Um, 
it hasn't done that so much recently. It gradually got pushed towards taking on a more kind of self-consciously uh, intersectionalist, um, uh, internationalist climate justice kind of um, orientation, which has made it more difficult for Extinction Rebellion to have any credibility in appealing to people of a centrist or let alone conservative kind of uh, mindset. Um, in terms of integral theory, as uh, as uh, uh, Liam Kavanagh, who I think is here, um, once said to me, uh, Extinction Rebellion is a classic example of a teal organization backsliding into being green. Um, or you could go further and you could say that uh, Extinction Rebellion was a green organization that was trying to be teal and actually found itself sometimes backsliding into being orange or, or red. Um, if that means anything to, to folks uh, on the call. Um, so look, what we need to do is what Extinction Rebellion tried to do. We just need to be more determined about actually doing it. And that's why the whole um, self-description, as I have it at least, of the moderate flank uh, is along those lines. Along those lines, It's about really being inclusive. It's about being inclusive of people who are not willing to get arrested. It's about challenge, being... Sorry, Rupert, just to challenge you again, because yeah. I've said this before, and it's still something I'm not fully persuaded by. Uh -huh. Not that I don't want to be mined, but just I'm thinking of this inclusive movement and I'm already thinking of the people who believe in green growth, for example, and there are, and there are many millions of them and they're actually in the ascendancy. I'm thinking of the people who want to invest in um, the future in some way and still are driven by a sort of underlying economic logic. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're the, they're, it's how things should be. I'm merely recognizing that there are many people who care about climate who disagree with you very fundamentally, philosophically, uh, you've already recognized they're different in many ways. But nonetheless, I still wonder if you're assuming that there can be a great degree of commonality, and this taps into Liam's question to everyone, what would it mean for a vast number of people to accept truth that wasn't capital T truth, that was pragmatic and perspectival and so forth? Yeah. Uh, because what, I, what concerns me is, there could be a deep reckoning. It could well be that after COP, we're like, okay, the grown-ups are not in the room. No one is going to really contend with this properly. Um, and, and it could even be that a critical number of people begin to see that the economic logic is the root problem and that that logic is somehow a spiritual problem because it's grounded in who we are as human beings and what we're living for. Yeah. And I hope that happens, right? But I don't really expect it. So, you know, how is this going to come about? What what degree of inclusivity is it reasonable to expect, given what we know about the degree of epistemic polarization, political polarization, uh, competing worldviews, incommensurate values? Please tell me I'm wrong about that. How does this work? Look, here's something that's quite important. Um, the, we need to make a distinction between the things that I believe uh, and the things that are required in order to get on board as part of the moderate flank. There are lots of things that I believe that you don't need to believe to get on board as part of the moderate flank, right? You don't have to believe that this civilization is finished. You don't have to believe that uh, that growth is uh, is definitely bad at this point in in human history. And I could, you know, I could go on reeling off another load of, of things you don't have to uh, uh, believe. Um, so uh, what it's a, what it's about is about. Um, a, a, a something which is genuinely inclusive, which is inclusive potentially across uh, political divides, which is uh, inclusive um, of uh, of people who are who want to go down the identity politics mode of being inclusive, and of people who don't, uh, which is inclusive uh, uh, of people who are um, uh, desperately afraid that uh, this civilization uh, is is finished. Uh, and people who are just kind of, you know, fairly afraid uh, and don't believe this civilization is finished. Uh, uh, people who are willing to to uh, to get arrested, people who are not willing to get arrested, to try to include all of those people in something which is um, probably on balance, you know, less full on than XR, but but more kind of uh, determined uh, and uh, willing to go uh, further than just voting, uh, giving money uh, every month, um, turning up on a, a march once in a while, uh, et cetera. So determined to, to, to create change, perhaps through the political system, determined to create change, certainly uh, through workplaces themselves, determined to create change, certainly 
uh, through communities uh, themselves and through building their resilience. And that comes to the last part of what I wanted uh, to say, which is that, of course, the beauty of, of the sort of resilience building um, wing of this um, is that that's kind of a good insurance policy um, anyway, um, right? So part of the point of transformative uh, adaptation uh, as a way forward um, is that we need to transform um, our system, um, but we also need to be um, preparing ourselves for the possibility that it isn't going to be fully uh, transformed at scale, in which case we need to be kind of providing exemplars, uh, uh, creating um, uh, areas of, uh, of, of greater uh, safety uh, and greater resilience uh, from the ground up. Um, and I think that that will definitely, again, be part of the response to the failing uh, of, uh, of us that will be happening at COP26, that there will be a big upsurge of people thinking things like, right, well, it's now about um, engaging in uh, agri-wilding, going back to the land, etc. I'm trying to provide a frame for that uh, as to how that could be seen as, as I think it should be seen as part of something bigger, part of something ultimately uh, worldwide, you know, protecting the, uh, the global um, locally, um, uh, being distributed, but yet in a certain sense also uh, scalable up and in fact sort of already scaled up um, in a certain sense. And, you know, do I, am I saying that this is all going to happen kind of dramatically uh, in early December? You know, no, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is I think that the, that, that COP26 and its likely failing of us is going to be a historic staging po post. It's going to be a, a moment potentially as significant in a, with a slightly different valence uh, as the uh, diplomatic success of the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cap off um, the extraordinary uh, sequence of, um, of weather disasters uh, and scientific reports which we've been, we've been having in the last year or two. Uh, and in that way, I think it, it's going to be uh, a historic moment, but it, it's only going to be one among a number of, of such moments probably that will occur in the 20s. Okay. Great. So I appreciate all of that, your, your essay, your time. We're right near the end now to everyone. So I want to ask one question, just because the essay is about the moderate flank. This is a question not to Rupert, but to everyone. Um, if you're new to Zoom, you'll look at the bottom of your screen, you'll have a reaction button. Um, and this is simply to put a kind of hand up in response to the question. I just want to know, um, the terminology is a challenge here. Like if Rupert's right, that what we need is a framing um, to be inclusive in many different senses of the term, politically, epistemically, culturally, in terms of generations, Moderate flank is not going to, you know, it's not a salesman's ideal, right? It's not a, it's not a term. Even moderates are not really motivated by the idea of moderation. And yet, a part of me was a little bit drawn to it as well. I sort of like it does what it says on the tinness of it, if that makes sense. Um, and I also like the fact that it wasn't another crisp framing narrative because there is some, a little sense of the culture being somewhat wise to that now, or here's a new framing. There's something about the kind of old school tell it like it is that I quite like. Nonetheless, my view doesn't matter that much in the wider scheme of things. So I'm just curious of those in the call, who likes the term moderate flank? First of all, put your hand up. Is that zero or is it slightly more? We have one, two, okay, we've got a few. It looks like we've got about five and we've got it. So, okay. It looks like about maybe a third of these people here like it. Who strongly dislikes it? Who feels it's actually letting down the argument? And here we have a bit more. It's something's a bit hard to tell immediately, but yeah, it looks like somewhat more people think it's letting down. Who has an immediate suggestion for what we, um, someone says they like the term massive moderate flank. Mm -hmm. add the adjective might make a difference because I think moderate flank is a bit, um, lacking in uh, sort of effective motivation, right? It sort of, it sounds too gray and sort of um, bureaucratic, but um, massive adds that kind of vitality to it. Does anyone else have an idea of what they'd want to call this largely inclusive movement that may not even be a movement? Any particular, anyone want to speak to it? If so, please unmute yourself. The unnamed movement or movement of movements. Well, I, I would just suggest that maybe a central front or something like that 
Only because, Rupert, when you think about uh, even strategies, flanks are usually the outside of a formation. What you're really talking about is a new center, right? The, the flank is usually, you know, in the Napoleon, or this is a Napoleonic term. What's on the edge is trying to get around. Kind of yeah, enemy. yeah. And this actually isn't a flank at all, what you're talking about. Well, yeah, but, but obviously that's kind of deliberate though, right? I'm deliberately sort of subverting the sense of the thought that a flank is always kind of further, because you know, I'm trying to subvert the sense that some people have had around Extinction Rebellion that, well, if we haven't got everything we wanted, then obviously we need to up the ante, obviously we need to escalate, which is what many people in XR now think. And that thinking is writ large in Burning Pink or in Insulate uh, Britain. And I was saying, well, what if we kind of, what if we went the other way? Would that perhaps be more strategic? But yeah, you know, I totally take uh, the, the thought, uh, Jonathan, you and I have talked about this before, that this, is, this term, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, it's a sort of reactive term. It's a kind of placeholder. Um, if this movement, if it is a movement, because maybe as we said earlier, part of the point is it needs to be going beyond movements. Um, if this movement, this thing um, comes to have some kind of identity at all, um, I suspect it will come to have a sort of more sort of um, positive uh, identity. And yeah, you're asking Jonathan, I think what that might be. And yeah, I'm, I'm all ears for, for what that might be. Okay, well, that's, that's homework for everyone if you like, so people can take that away. Just on, just on what Laurie just put in the chat, yeah, to what, at the very end of the piece, I, I reference uh, Paul Hawkin and, and make a kind of similar point or move to him and his talk of the blessed unrest. Um, I, th I think that what I'm talking about is the sort of blessed unrest that we uh, need and to some small extent already have growing um, for our time. Right. Okay, brilliant. Well, I mean, those who don't know Blessed Unrest, I can recommend. Um, Paul Hawken also has a new book coming out on climate change, which I think I don't, I can't speak to, but I know that it will be a big uh, contribution. Vis-a-vis -vis Rupert's earlier comments on activism, I just want to take this chance to plug a recent book by Perspectiva written by Anthea Lawson called The Entangled Activist, which gets to some of the undercurrents that Rupert's been talking about, about how to be an activist better today, but also what the whole idea of activism evokes and how to live with the fact that some are comfortable being activists and some aren't. This very much gets into the climate conundrum writ large. And um, there will be more climate conversations from us in due course um, and more essays coming. We've got another essay coming out uh, on Thursday that's actually by Mark Vernon, who asked the question earlier about spiritual intelligence. And while it's not very directly about the moderate flank, there is a sense in which what will this large group of humanity, this mass moderate flank that has to contend with these existential conundrums for the globe as a whole, how will they be, what kind of perception will they have of life? Um, what does it mean to them to be human? These questions are looming large in every context we look. So um, by all means follow up with Rupert personally, you read the essay, it's very, very strongly recommended. Um, and if you can find a way to get involved in something resembling the, a feature of the moderate flank, then um, I would certainly encourage you to do so. And in the meantime, any marketing you can do on the term, all the better. Because we're yeah. aware yeah, that yeah. Uh, Great. Uh, further to go. So any, any further thoughts, Rupert, before we go? No, no, I, it's been super. I really appreciate the, the questions. I'm going to digest the, the chat at my leisure after this. And uh, yeah, yeah, do, uh, do read Antonia's uh, book. Uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that, that Mark will be kind of probably uh, going into some of what I was touching on when I talked about eco spirituality very briefly. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd obviously love people to, uh, to read the essay, share it, uh, talk to me about it. Great. Okay, well, thanks all for joining. And also a special thanks to those who give a small donation. It's an interesting challenge for organizations these days to know whether to charge for events, because on the one hand, there's an access issue, on the other hand, there's a sustainability issue. So those who voluntarily donated, a special thank you to you, but thanks to all, all of you for coming and we will see you next time. So you're